this morning about the equation sheet. I just sent it like 10 minutes ago. But this is the equation sheet. You'll have it on your, uh, on the, all the quizzes and stuff that you have from here on out. So also for the final. Uh, you will have additional things. Chapters 9 and 10 are still sort of unformed. So uh, I'll add those as they come up. Okay. So you'll have this on Friday as well as Monday. Also, for the, uh, the little, I don't know, derivation on Friday, remember I told you we were either going to have the cylinder or the thin rod, either this one, and you'll see that, we either have this or this. Um, actually, I want it to be easy for you all, I really just want it to be that you can walk into the test on Monday with 10 points already in the bag. Uh, so we'll just do it as I'll provide both of those, and then you get to choose one. Does that make it easier for you? Yeah, I just want you to memorize it honestly. And I want you, no, you can't do both. Uh, you'll have to choose one. So just choose one that you like the best. Me the method is the same for both of them. I just really want you to get to practice with the method. Do you have a question, Ron? Uh, yeah, can we do both? And if you get one wrong, you can No, I'm not going to grade two. <laughs> I mean, you, you shouldn't get them wrong anyway, right? Because you just, you know, it's really only a couple of things that you need to remember. And I think you could look at it right before the, the little quiz and then. And just write on a sheet of paper. Okay? Is that clear? It's not meant to be hard. It's meant to be simple. It's meant to burn the back of our eyeballs and right. into sleepless nights. All right. Uh, let's see. How do I get rid of this? We're going to work through some problems today for Newton's second law. And then I think we will get to energy and momentum. Um, I think those problems make good for you. They, they sort of all tie in together. So we'll work with them. Okay, chapter 7, so if you're working on chapter 7, you can start with it. Do you have any questions? Comments? Where is this concept question solving? Is this just Supposed to be questions? Yeah, that's so that uh, you can download the questions uh, to prepare for class if you wish. But that's only the two chapters. Oh, did it finish at chapter seven? All right, I'll just update them and include chapter eight. Okay. All right. I'm okay. sorry for that. This one. Is Most people don't use them. Do you use them before class? Oh, this is the first time I tried. Oh, okay. <laughs> I tried to be clear. I waited here. Okay, good. All right. Any other questions? You're clear on what's happening on Friday? I'm going to give you a sheet of paper. It'll be those figures from the notes with the bar and the cylinder, one on one side, one on the other side. I'll ask you to X through one and then choose the other, and then you'll just write out the derivation like you did in class. And I will provide you the table, that table right there, so you'll know what the, the end result is going to be. Okay. I'll be looking that you get the DM defined correctly and also your limits of integration defined correctly. Uh, all right? Is that clear? There's a quiz for those two derivations that we did on Monday. The derivation is for the moments of inertia for the cylinder and the thin rod. All right. Were you here on Monday? Uh, you can find it online. I get together with you. All right. this Screen test is online. That's true, right? Anybody look at it? The screen test for Monday? Are there any issues with it? No. All right. Um, all right, well, let's get started. Uh, let's try this quick test. This is a figure with four balls right here, and each has uh, a one mass of one kilogram. And they're attached to these massless rods, which are on a square that are one meter in length. I'm going to write the answers over here. 2.5. Now for this, you're going to treat these as discrete particles. So we did a problem similar to this where we had the three balls that were rotating about the axis. This is a similar problem to that. So you want to start with your definition for moment of inertia and then calculate the moment of inertia for these four balls, adding up each individual component. Yeah. Is it a one meter from ball to ball? They're on a square that's one meter. 
So they're connected by these rods here. So the distance from here to here is one meter, uh, here to here is one meter. And they're rotating by this axis, which bisects that square. It cuts right down the middle. You should move over here. I don't think we're going to get a new projector bolt for this anytime soon. Hopefully by next semester. About 20 more seconds. Let's stop at 3:15 or 3:10, rather. 3:10. All right. Good. D is right. So in this, remember when moments of inertia. We're going to have two different scenarios. We'll have discrete particles. These are particles that are just rotating around an axis. And then we'll also have regular shapes, like cylinders, uh, spheres, stuff like that. And they'll come up, we'll see them when we do energy and, and momentum both. Um, but this is discrete particles. So I just say I is equal to the sum of MR squared. That's I have one kilogram balls that are a half a meter from the axis. And it's going to be the same for all four, so it's going to be one kilogram times a half a meter squared. And the four are all the same, so I'll just multiply that by four, so that's four times a quarter, which is one. <coughs> so D is the right answer, MR squared. I just add up the contribution from each individual part. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. All right. Um, So now we're going to move in a Newton second law, and we'll work through some problems. If I where if I apply a torque to an object, how does that affect its motion? And then we'll also see a little bit of energy and linear momentum to round out this chapter. Uh, so if you remember with linear motion, this was Newton's second law, that our net force, that's the sum of all our forces, equals the mass times the acceleration. And this also applies in circular motion, uh, but instead of force, we're going to have torque, where torque is a measure of the uh, oh, sorry. moments of inertia. The moments of inertia. This is a measure of the rotational inertia. And we also have the angular acceleration, alpha, which is a measure of the, uh, the, or the angular acceleration, or the rotational acceleration. 
All right, so before where we had F equals MA, now we're going to have the torque, which is our analog to the force in our rotational system, is equal to I times alpha. And here torque is a vector quantity and alpha is a uh, angular quantity, or a vector quantity. All right, so this is just Newton's second law, but expressed for a rotational frame. Torque is equal to I alpha. Uh, just as we had before, torques in the clockwise direction are considered to be negative, and those in the counterclockwise direction are considered to be positive. Uh, we don't really get into this that much, but this isn't really the vector direction of the torque. We'll see this a bit next semester. But to find the vector direction of the torque, like we've been doing, uh, you have to use the right-hand rule. All right? And when we do the cross product, the R cross F, which you will see on your test Monday, you will see a cross product, by the way. Uh, but when we do a cross product to find the torque, that's actually what gives the direction. But when we use this plus minus, that's not really the direction. That's more of a, a notation that we use. So try not to get that confused with direction. All right. Um, let's do an example, and then I'll let you work one on your own. Um, I have a... Shoot, where'd it go? I have a disc. It's allowed to rotate about its central axis, and I just want to know what is its angular acceleration. All right, so I want to know what alpha is. Uh, this is a disc, but for alpha, I know that the the net torque is equal to I times alpha. So I want to know alpha. So in order to know that, I need to know what is the net torque and what is the moment of inertia. You want to look back at your table, that table um, a few pages back, where you have all the, the shapes for the different objects. Which object is this going to be? I'll put back there as well. This is a disk. So which of these is it going to be? To find the moment of inertia, which one of these will I use? What's that? The wheel? Well, wheel is hollow on the inside. And our disk is solid on the inside. And the cylinder. The what? The cylinder. OK, the cylinder. Yeah, so a disk is like a flat cylinder, right? Which cylinder are we going to use? The one that does like a ballerina or the one that does like a gymnast? The ballerina, right? We're gonna do the ballerina disc, the one that rotates about this axis, because that's how our that's how our disc is rotating, like a like a ballerina. <coughs> We're gonna use this one for our moment of inertia. Um, so I find my moment of inertia, which is gonna be that for a disc, which is one half m r squared. That's one half. Let's see. I didn't have a mass here, but we'll just say that the mass is one kilogram make the numbers easier. One kilogram times one meter squared. So that's 0.5 kilogram meter squared. So that's my moment of inertia. And then I want to find my net torque. So I call this torque two and this torque one. What's going to be the sign for torque two? Is torque two going to cause clockwise or counterclockwise motion? Torque two. It causes clockwise motion. If you think of this as like a steering wheel, if I push up on this side, it moves it in the clockwise direction. So torque two is clockwise, so that's going to be negative. Torque one is counterclockwise, so that's positive. So my net torque, the sum of all those torques, is going to be positive torque one minus torque two. And then it's just a matter of putting in my numbers here uh, torque, the magnitude of the torque is fr sine theta. For both of these, the angle between the moment arm and the force is 90 degrees, so that sine theta term goes away. So it's going to be, uh, well, torque 1 is 1 newton times 1 meter minus 2 newtons times 1 meter. So my net torque is negative one newton meters. Negative one. That means it's in the clockwise direction. Uh, you can see this just from looking at it because F2 is at the same moment arm, but it's twice as big. So we know that that force is going to dominate the rotation. All right, now it's just a matter of returning to our Newton second law. Torque 
the net torque equals I alpha. I want to know alpha. That's going to be torque over moment of inertia. That's negative 1. That's going to give me an alpha of negative 2 radians per second squared. And since it's negative, that means it's in a clockwise direction. All right. And then from that, you can do all the stuff like we did in chapter 7. Uh, given an angular acceleration, what is its displacement? What is its velocity after so much time? Uh, just like the problems that we had. And that's what you'll see. We'll work through a problem just now uh, on the test Monday. Those types of things with Newton's second law. If I had these multiple forces acting on this irregularly, or this regularly shaped object, a disk, a sphere, a rod, whatever, uh, what is its angular displacement after so much time? What is its uh, angular velocity after so much time? Let's try one on your own. Next page. go around, constant force applied to it. In this case, it's just a single force. Uh, find the angular speed. your table, figure out which kind of object this is, find its moment of inertia, then find the net torque, the simple in this case, is there's just one force, find alpha, and then find omega, which is something. Yeah. What is the merry-go-round? What's the merry-go-round? <laughs> yeah, it's like a big disc. It jumps onto it and spin around. Oh, it's a disc. Okay. Merry-go-round's a disc. the problem. push these little bitty buttons on this thing. So our fingers are too fat. Just push two buttons at once. Try to wrap it up. So I've got three forty, ten more seconds. Five seconds.
Oh boy, okay. Let's see, we're all over the place. Uh, I don't know if A is correct or not, let's see. But first of all, this is a disk, so my moment of inertia is one half mr squared. Whenever you encounter one of these problems, you're almost certainly going to need to know the moment of inertia. So I'm just going to calculate it over here. Uh, one half of 100 kilograms times one meter is the radius squared, so that's 50 kilogram meter squared. All right. Now, I know that the sum of the torques equals I alpha, so alpha is the torque over the moment of inertia. I have a force that's applied tangentially. That means that it's perpendicular to the uh, radius, so the theta is 90 degrees. Uh, that torque is applied at, 50, at 1 meter, so I have 50 newtons, 1 meter divided by I, which is 50. So that gives me a alpha of 1 radian per second squared. And now I want to know what is the angular speed, that's omega, is omega naught plus alpha T. So I guess I wanted you to put B, mine just stopped right there, is that right? If you put B, you yeah. just... I yeah. can see the three seconds, it's all like... Okay, okay, yeah, we're looking for angular speed, not acceleration. Yes, I, I think I need to take it mm -hmm. And you should expect that when you see these torque problems, they're going to be paired with problems like from Chapter 7. You probably won't see separate problems like from Chapter 7. It does work out to A. Yeah, it does work out to A. So uh, omega naught, it says it starts from rest right here. So omega naught is zero. So omega then is alpha T, which is one radian per second squared times three seconds, which is three radians per second. So A is the right answer here. Uh, C. I'm not sure where C comes from. I forget, but the answer. I got C and I, always, I missed the other one half in the whole inertia equation. Oh yeah, so you did MR squared instead of one half. Yeah, so you have to be careful that you get the right shape. So, you know, a, a disc is a cylinder, a sphere, make sure that you determine whether it's a solid or a hollow sphere because we have two different kinds. Uh, and then also make sure with the cylinder that you get the right axis, if it's spinning about this axis or if it's spinning about this axis. We often use cylinders because that's like a flywheel, those sort of things. Uh, you could also see a rod. All right, um, let's work through another one. Let's look at an old exam. Uh, we'll look at follow five, exam three. Just for a little extra practice on this. Uh, I have a question. If yeah. you had a disc and you're spinning this way, okay, you use the ballerina one, but what if the disc flips up this way and still. It doesn't matter. It's still going to have the same moment of inertia. That's not changing or anything like that. No, as long as it's still spinning about the center axis. So the only way you would change is if you came in this way and started to spin. You wouldn't stand straight up and spin it. It's just spun a corner on the pole. Mm -hmm. That's what it would be. Really it seems like it should change, doesn't it? Like, because the force of gravity be acting on it different yeah, so ways. If it flips it up this way, you start spinning from the center axis. That's what I was thinking. It would be. Yeah. I don't think it changes. I'm pretty sure it doesn't. It does. Because your, your moment of inertia is like an inherent and intrinsic property, so it shouldn't change from where it is. So, I mean, that's when you start with a pulley or something like that, where you see a different problem with this variable that's not involved. No. 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 Oh, God, what do you think of the way you have to found barely system? Not really. It's not really that important. I'm just saying. Air resistance is only necessary whenever it's in terminal velocity. Okay, well, let's look at another problem. This is exam three, follow five. I think this is it. Uh, number five, I think. No, it was, I think it was number six. No, I guess that was, okay, uh, follow seven exam three. Okay, yeah, this one. So this figure shows a uniform disc. It can rotate about its center like a merry-go-round, so a very similar problem. Uh, it has a radius of 10 centimeters and a mass of 50 grams and initially it rests. I have a force, two forces 
uh, and after a time of four and a half seconds, the disk has omega, the angular velocity of 200 radians per second. Force F1 has a magnitude of 0.4 newtons. What is the magnitude of F2? Again, this is uh, exam three, follow seven. You can have a similar procedure here, although you're looking for sort of a different thing. You'll need to find I. Um, you'll need to find alpha, which will allow you to find your net torque through Newton's second law. I'm going to go and start writing down everything that we know, which I'll keep on working. first step here would be to find alpha. You have this information, so I can find alpha. Alpha is omega minus omega naught over T. That comes from our kinematics equation. You might have alpha. 44.4. That's what you got too, Scott? All right, it's negative, right, uh, because omega is negative here. So it's negative 44.4, and that's in radians per second squared. Then we also need to find I, which is 1 half mr squared. That's 1 half of 0.1 times, or excuse me, 0.05 times 0.1 squared. Might have that for me? It would be 0.01. It's 10 no, it's no, point no. 0.1. Yeah, yeah. Two decimal places over. I was thinking about What did you get, Rob? I got a point zero 0.01. 
Three zero. Zero zero three. How many? Three zero. Three zero. Okay, yeah. So that's in kilogram meter squared. And now, you know, this is a similar problem, but now we're going sort of from a different approach. I know that my torque equals I alpha. Alright, so now I'm finding my net torque, which is going to be 0 0.0025 kilogram meter squared times negative 44.4. And that'll give me my net torque, which is negative what? What is it, Eddie? Point zero one one. Uh, and that's in Newton meters. Right. So now that's our net torque. And now I'm looking for one of these forces. So I know that both of these forces cause this torque. Uh, they're both perpendicular, so that means my sine theta term goes away. Um, F2 causes torque 2, and it is counterclockwise, so it's positive. F1 causes a negative torque 1. And so this is going to equal negative torque 1 plus torque 2. Um, I know the magnitude of force 1, so I have negative 0 0.011 equals negative 0.4 newtons times 0.1 plus F2 times 0.1 meters and then I just solve for F2. Somebody tell me what F2 is? What is it? 0.5. Anybody agree? Anybody agree with that? I'm going to write it up here. Try and verify that. I, I don't know what the answer is right off. That sounds reasonable. Oh yeah, over here. It should have been point zero. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Just making sure. But I trust this is correct. Is it point five? You might collaborate there. Point three. Point three? Yeah. Point two nine. What? Point two nine. Okay, sorry, Warren. I think you've been outvoted. I got point three. We should do tests by crowdsourcing. I think like we should have a democratic thing. Is it point three? You find your mistake? It's working out. I don't know. I don't want to work it out. You don't want to talk to him. Well, we can work it out. We can have a meeting over here. That's point four. You got point four? All right, somewhere between point three and point five. <laughs> All right. It doesn't really matter what the number is. Well, it is point four because we can always bring it up. Oh, I get it now. Okay. Is this okay? Yeah. Fine with it. Now, if you look back at old tests, like from the previous semesters, more recent semesters, you'll see similar problems to this, but you'll also see problems where uh, you have to find the torque. Uh, they're given in vector notation. And in order to find the net torque, you have to find the cross product. But otherwise, they're similar. Is it point three? Okay. Okay. Let's do... Yeah, I got point three. Okay, point three. I believe that. Okay, let's do um, a few clicker questions from the concept test for chapter eight. Yeah, okay, with, you feel a little comfortable with this? A little more comfortable? It's similar to what we did before in chapter four.
I think we're going to skip energy altogether. Yeah, I'm serious. All right, so two spheres have the same radius and equal masses. One is made of solid aluminum, and the other is a hollow shell of gold. Because gold is a lot more dense, so for it to be the same mass, one is solid aluminum, and one is just a shell of gold. Which has the bigger moment of inertia? The solid aluminum sphere, which has the same mass as a hollow gold sphere. You can look at your table, and that's fine, but uh, you can also just think about how the mass is distributed. Remember, I is mr squared. Uh, so how does the distribution of the mass affect your moment of inertia? Yeah, they have the same mass and same radius. It's just how the mass is distributed. Five more seconds. Stop at one thirty. Because he's right, the hollow gold sphere. Um, because it has a lot more mass at big radii, that MR squared, the R dominates because it's squared. So the, the gold sphere has a larger moment of inertia. Listen, how would y'all feel? I don't normally do this, but I don't want to rush into this test on Monday. How would y'all feel to move it to Wednesday? Very excited. Let's. Uh, I'm gonna take a poll. Right? It'll be anonymous. But so, like, I'm not gonna share the results. So, so A is Monday, and B is Wednesday. What's that? You want to take it today? Okay. So go ahead. So answer honestly. I'm not going to show the results. So, but if there's more than say two people that don't want it, I'm not going to change it. All right. A is Monday. B is Wednesday. I'll stop at 20 seconds. Put C. <laughs> I guess I guess C is today. <laughs> In my own biology class, we were uh, taking a like quiz at the end of things. All of a sudden, the numbers started skyrocketing past what our class held, like by over like a hundred, and we figured out that there were like tons of students from the next two classes just like clicking their clickers. Right. Yeah, so we'll do it on Wednesday. I know that there are one or two of you that, that would rather not, and I apologize for that. I know you've been preparing for this all semester. But, um, yeah, we'll still have that little quiz on Friday. I don't even call it a quiz. It's just, it's just like a, I don't know what it is. You're giving us a 10 question. points. Can we just give it to us? Give it to us now. <laughs> it's a single question. What's that? I think that'll be a little better, and then we can ease into it a little bit more. We can spend some more time practicing. Okay. It's a test with a huge amount of space between the first and the second question. And then we have to skip it. So, um, all right. So let's look at energy. Uh, 
are these two? Yeah, I have, I'm missing something here. All right, so if you recall before when we had kinetic energy, kinetic energy was one half mv squared. All right, and if we translate this into a rotational frame, this is a translational kinetic energy. And now if we have a rotational kinetic energy, it's going to be one half times what, what squared? M becomes what? I, right. So our M is inertia or moment of inertia. And then V is omega. So my expression for kinetic energy is one half I omega squared. That's on that equation sheet that you have. Um, it's on the internet. And all the, Everyone has it. all the stuff also applies to conservation of energy, uh, the work energy theorem. Primarily, we'll look at the work energy theorem. We're not going to get too much into conservation of energy like the roller coaster problems, though you can work some of the problems here with a rotational rotating object, but we won't get into that. Um, but the work energy theorem says that if you do work on an object, it changes its energy, and that also applies here. So if I have a rotating object, if I want to determine how much work is required to stop it, I can just figure out what is its kinetic energy. And then that'll be the work required to stop it. So let's look at an example here. Uh, say I have a thin hoop that's rotating at 10 radians per second. Uh, in order to find the amount of energy required to stop it, I first find the moment of inertia, which for a hoop is just mr squared. If you look back at that table, it's mr squared. Uh, that's going to be one kilogram times one meter squared. So that's one kilogram meter squared. And the kinetic energy then is going to be one half I omega squared. So my kinetic energy is one half of one kilogram meter squared times omega, which is 10 radians per second. Notice that when we're calculating this kinetic energy, that all of our units have to be SI units, and so our, our uh, omega has to be in radians, radians per second, and that gives us 50. Can I remember the units for energy? Joules, right. So uh, 50 joules. Uh, so that's the amount of energy required to stop the wheel, or the amount of work that's required to stop it. And then we can also determine the amount of power that's, that's involved. So power, if you recall, is work or energy over time. So that's just going to be 50 joules. If it takes you five seconds to stop it, then you will have expended 10 watts of power in doing that. Right. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's try this problem. Okay, this is a similar problem that we had with uh, Newton's second law. Have these huge flywheels. There's a mass and radius. There's a shaft that connects to them, and then there's a frictional force. what we have here is uh, we have a big flywheel and then yeah these these flywheels they turn on a shaft but between the shaft and the flywheel there's a frictional force and that's that frictional force of 28 kilonewtons and that frictional force is going to act to slow down the flywheel I want to know how long will it take uh, to stop Similar procedures we had from before. You want to find the moment of inertia of the flywheels. A uh, flywheel is a big, big disc, right? Um, figure out the net torque that acts upon them. Figure out the acceleration, and then from your kinematics, you can find 
the time. I'm going to start filling in a few things. Somebody have an eye for me? Moment of inertia? Uh, Alright, we'll just call it 32,000. Somebody have a torque, a net torque? Uh, 5,800. What is it? 5,300. Alright, we'll just call it 5,900. Newton meters. Uh, so that gives me my alpha, which is 30 or 5900 over 32,000. Can you tell me what that is? What is that? What's that? Right, it's 21 centimeters. Oh yeah, so that should be half that, I'm sorry. Is that what you're getting at, Andrew? Yeah, so this should be uh, 0 0.21 divided by 2. How does that affect this over here? What, 29, 50, 3,000? Yeah, we'll just call it 3,000 radians per, or Newton meters, rather. And then we get uh, over here 3,000 divided by 32,000. What is that? 3 over 32. second squared. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, and now my uh, now I want to know the time required to stop from its normal rotation rate of 420 revolutions per minute. So our omega initial is 420 revolutions per minute. I'm going to go and convert this into radians per second because my angular acceleration is in radians per second squared. 
So I have one revolution, two pi radians, one minute, 60 seconds. So that is uh, 840 over 6 times 5. I get 44 radians per second. And then omega final is going to equal 0. Alpha is 0 0.09. Since omega equals omega naught plus alpha t, uh, I'm looking for t. So that's going to be uh, 0 minus 44 over 0 0.09. However, since it's slowing down, I know that my angular acceleration is going to be the opposite direction from my angular velocity. So I'm going to put a negative here. Otherwise, I get a negative time. So I get 44 over 0 0.09. Yeah, 490 seconds, I'll call it. So that's a pretty long time for this shaft to, even though it's exerting quite a large force, 28,000 newtons. These are such huge flywheels, they just take a really long time to stop. So, um, all right, that's 490 seconds. And then we also want to know what is the angular displacement that it goes through. So theta equals omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. I know all these values, it's just a matter of plugging them in. That's 44 radians per second times 490 seconds plus one half. Be careful here because our alpha is negative. Negative 0 0.09 radians per second squared times 490 squared. One last thing before y'all leave. I just want to remind, I want to do this poll again about the exam uh, Monday or Wednesday. And I want to remind you, I don't like changing exam dates, but I want to remind you that, uh, that, that uh, if we move it to Wednesday, that's going to be after the drop date. Wait, is that right? When's drop day? Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday is drop day. So that means that it will no longer, like you won't have that grade before drop day. So just click in again, please. Uh, what was it again? Uh, a is Monday or B is Wednesday. All right, just a few more seconds. Stop at 25. <laughs> Monday, we'll have it on Monday, but we'll limit the material. I'll, I'll see what we'll do. So we'll have more practice. Okay. Are you going to adjust the sheet so there's no which ones are on the test and which ones are on the test? Yeah. Yeah. Can you put it on so I can go back to the office? All right. Sorry, I tried. Monday is going to be our test day. Yeah. I'll send an email. So if I put it on Friday, okay, right? I will have a question. I'll ask you. I need to put it on the show. All right, y'all have a great day. I'll see you. It's time to move the world. Be careful out there. It's a crazy world. I got lost. Are you going to be here after 4.30? Are you going to be here after 4.30? <laughs> 
Does it matter what, um, it has to be five minutes in, uh, less than five, less than five minutes in, uh, it, uh, does it matter what kind of movie it is? Does it have to be real? Can it be a cartoon? No, I don't watch, I don't watch much more than cartoons. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh no, because see the uh, this is our radius that the force is acting on. See this is a big flywheel like this, and you have a shaft that goes through it. So if you imagine this is a flywheel, there's a shaft that it attaches to, and it rotates on that shaft, mm -hmm. and the force is applied at the radius of the shaft. So here, instead of being 1.4 meters, it should be 21. Yeah. Should be 21 centimeters. I had to turn it off, now. Mallory, I had to turn it off. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, you follow me? The force is that is acting on the shaft, not on the flywheel. So you you have that because that's how it's set up. I mean, it has this big flywheel, and the shaft goes through it, and then there's a frictional force between the shaft and the flywheel. And the frictional force acts. Okay, uh, I need a wheel. Right. Let's imagine this is the wheel. And it rotates about this shaft. This shaft has a diameter of 21 centimeters. Right. And it exerts a force on the wheel, which acts at 21 centimeters. So if I look overhead at the wheel, like say this is the wheel overhead, mm -hmm. this is the shaft, right, that's the shaft, the force is acting right there, that's my 28,000. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay? Because so it's so like spinning on the top. Uh, the person like leaves. Uh, uh, yeah, it's an hour force. Yeah, it's an hour force. Like that's okay. similar to that. Like that from the Okay, both eat. Um, this is center, right? Just the end of 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 the end Right. And it spins on a shaft. Right, so if I want to look at it from the side, this is the flywheel, right, and then I have this shaft that goes through it. And this big flywheel turns around this shaft. Right, so this is that shaft. Um, but at the interface between the flywheel and the shaft, there is a frictional force. That's okay. That's equal to 28 kilonewtons. Okay. Right, if I have something that's spinning on a shaft, it's going to have some frictional forces between the shaft and the wheel. Okay. 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 Is that clear? Well, I'm not ready, but I'm trying to understand it. Okay. I think it's probably just the words that are. Okay. Thank you.